Good beginnings stick with us. Several years ago now, my wife went to go see the movie The Greatest Showman with some friends. And she came back just raving about how good of a movie it was. So eventually we found a night where the kids went to bed on time. No easy feat. And we had the time to watch the movie from beginning to end. And it definitely lived up to the hype. But the part that stuck with me the most, that first time watching it, was that opening song. You had that opening riff, whoa, 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 whoa. the drums beat come in, boom, boom, boom. and then the bass and the drums come in, and some electric guitar and other strings, even a lion roaring. And it builds up and crescendos and then goes completely silent. And Hugh Jackson's voice comes in with a kind of whisper singing, singing, Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. Crescendoing again through the verse until you reach the chorus. Everything about the opening song builds anticipation and excitement, filling the audience with expectations and interest. And at the end of the song, that first time watching the movie, I distinctly remember looking over at Ellie and saying, now that's the way you start a movie. Because everything about it drew you in. It made you want to know what was going to happen next. And the movie was great. And side note, if you've never seen the YouTube videos of the cast running through some of their songs and rehearsals, please go. You have to. It's really awesome. But that beginning set the stage for the rest of the movie. As we turn our attention to the way the Gospel of Mark begins, we have to admit that in its own way, it is also a thrilling beginning to the story that the writer of Mark wants to tell about Jesus. While the Gospel of Mark is less sophisticated than other Gospel accounts of Jesus' life, Mark often doesn't say things the right way or use the correct grammar. What the Gospel writer lacks in sophistication, he makes up for in storytelling. In fact, even in these first few verses, everything about the way the author of Mark begins the Gospel points to the reality that God is up to something new, something big. The very first verse that we didn't read in verse 1 begins with the same Greek word that the Greek translation of Genesis begins with, R-K. And it brings back memories of God acting new ways in creation. God is up to something new. John the Baptist appears not in the temple or in the streets of Jerusalem. No, he appears in the wilderness a place where God often leads the people into in order to deliver them. It echoes the foundational story of the people of God in the book of Exodus, where God delivers them from slavery in Egypt. The wilderness being a place of deliverance and salvation, God acting in a decisive new way. John is baptizing people in the Jordan River, if you were a good Jewish hearer of this story, the fact that John was baptizing in the Jordan would have taken you back to the end of that wilderness journey, where after 40 years of wandering, the people stood on the east side of the river, that barrier between where they were and the promises that God was leading them into, the promises that would be revealed, realized when God when they go past the Jordan. And even the description of John would have evoked within the hearer the prophets of old. We read this today and think, at least I do, John was really weird. <laughs> Camel's hair, locusts and honey as a diet. I mean, anybody going to lunch eating locusts and honey this afternoon? I didn't think so. But for those who are immersed in the Hebrew Bible, living with the constant hope that God would one day come and deliver them, John would have reminded them of Elijah and the other great prophets of old who prepared the people for the new thing that God was going to do. When you picture all of this as a backdrop for John's ministry, it is no wonder that the atmosphere was electric. So electric that Mark says, likely with a bit of hyperbole that is present in all good storytellers, that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to see what he was doing. It didn't matter who you were. If you were young or old, if you were rich or poor, the powerful and the powerless, the pious, those who had left religion behind, those living in penthouses and those who were on the farm, everyone was heading out to see what John was doing. 
in what he was preaching. And his message was essentially this, God is about to write a new chapter in the story of redemption. So repent and be forgiven. For someone is coming who is more powerful than I, and this person is so wonderful that I, even as a prophet, am not worthy to sit down and untie his shoes. Now that's a little bit of a weird image for us, maybe especially those of us who are parents and are constantly dealing with our kids' shoes. But in that day, students who followed their teacher were expected to do whatever the teacher asked, except, as one rabbi said, untying their sandals. That was a job that was considered too low for students to do. But John here is saying the one who is coming is so great that even I as a prophet am not worthy to do that task. God is about to do something new. John preached it. The people felt it. And Mark invites us as readers to experience the excitement and anticipation of that moment at the beginning of his gospel. And at the end of verse 8... We are left with this implicit question that all those who surrounded John would have been asking, as well as those hearers listening to the Gospel of John would have been asking, who is this person who is coming? And Mark wastes no time in answering the question. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee to be baptized by John in the Jordan River. And for Mark, the fact of Jesus' baptism isn't nearly as important as what happens Next, as Jesus comes up out of the water, Mark says that Jesus saw heaven being torn open by the presence of the Spirit who descends like a dove. And God's voice, that same voice that is full of power and majesty, echoes through the clouds and affirms Jesus' identity. You are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. It is this moment This declaration, this affirmation that I am convinced carries Jesus throughout his ministry and mission. When Jesus is in the desert being tempted by the evil one, this moment gives him strength. When the religious leaders oppose Jesus telling him, you can't do that. It is God's assurance that he is indeed God's son that keeps him going. It is this assurance that gives Jesus the courage to say the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe. And when fear threatens to overtake Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus wearily walks the road to the hill where he would be crucified, it is his confidence in who he is and God's voice from this moment that keeps him going. All because he knew the truth that God had declared, you are mine, I love you. I delight in you. It is this moment of baptism and the voice of God Jesus experiences as he comes out of the water that carries Jesus throughout his ministry and gives him the confidence to fulfill his mission. And as I've reflected on the baptism of Jesus for this moment in the life of First Baptist Waynesboro, I can't help but see some similarities We also stand at the precipice of a new chapter that God is writing in our story together. It's certainly a story that has had many chapters filled with God's goodness and grace, with trials and triumphs, but also one that has many yet to be written. We, like the people who left their homes and villages to see John, are all different. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different places. We have our own doubts and fears We are in different places economically and politically. We are different in so many ways, and yet we are united in our excitement and anticipation of what the future holds for our church. And we are eager to hear what God is going to do next. We, like John, point to the reality that the one we serve is greater than we are. The one who didn't remain distant from our sin and brokenness, but came and bore it so that we might live and be invited to experience the abundant life that God has for us. And as we look to the future, we must admit, there is much we do not know. There will be trials we can't foresee and triumphs that will fill us with joy. We will fail one another. We will forgive one another. And we will walk that hard journey of reconciliation. We will have to tell each other hard truths. We will pick each other up when we are down, and we will dream together 
the ways God is calling us to love and serve our community as we seek to reach our community and our world for Christ. And the only way we can realize the dreams that God has for us is if we, like Jesus, are confident in who we are. For that same voice that tore the heaven apart to speak truth over Jesus also rips through the fabric of the universe to speak a similar truth over us. We are God's. God loves us. And as we seek to live lives in faithful obedience, God is pleased with us. So long as we allow that voice to be the loudest voice in our lives, we can meet every trial and triumph with the same confidence that our Lord displayed time and again as he fulfilled his mission to show the world the great depth of God's love and grace. I'm reminded of the movie Moana. Stick with me here for a minute. If you don't know, Moana in that movie is a young woman who lives on an island with her people. She is destined to be their next leader, but she constantly feels this pull that she is being drawn to something different, to something more. When her island is threatened, she is sent by the ocean, it's a little weird, on this mission to save her island. And throughout the movie, she learns and grows and faces every challenge with this belief that the ocean chose her to save her island by restoring the heart of Tefiti, a goddess in the story who had become like this fiery monster. Moana teams up with this demigod Maui, whom she picks up as a helper along the way, and finally gets to the point where they can attempt to restore the heart of Tefiti, and they fail miserably. And Moana begins to doubt everything. She is filled with fear and even questions whether or not she actually understood the ocean correctly. Her partner Maui even tells her bluntly that if the ocean chose her, it chose wrong. And she finally gets to the breaking point and tells the ocean, choose someone else. Instead, the ghost of her grandma shows up to encourage her. And eventually, through song, because it's Disney, she asks, Moana, who are you? And that leads to the famous song, which then also crescendos to Moana declaring, I am Moana. And she goes back, tries again, and succeeds. Now, why do I share this story? Because ultimately, Moana's crisis wasn't one of ability. It was a crisis of identity. She failed, and that caused her to doubt who she was. And when she questioned who she was, it was impossible for her to see herself as having the ability to overcome. It's not like she went back the second time around with new abilities. It was just a few hours later. When she went back and succeeded, she had a deeper belief in her identity. Jesus was able to meet every challenge confidently because he knew who he was. And as we seek to follow him into the new chapter that we are being called into, our greatest challenges will not be crises of ability. God has and will continue to equip us with everything we need to follow where the Spirit calls. Our greatest challenge will be remaining confident in who we are. And whenever there is a voice that seeks to creep in and cause doubt, may we return to this moment in the life of Jesus. May we remember our own baptisms and find strength and peace in the voice of God that tore the heavens on that day and continues to do so every day with each of us. After all, we are God's. God loves us. And God delights in us.